Hi, this is Kevin Greer, and welcome to our Bible study. Um, we're always glad that you can join in with us whatever, whenever you can and wherever you can, anywhere in the world. So this is our Bible study on the book of Romans. This is the second part. Um, last week, we started with the first chapter, of course, and um, we didn't get out of the first verse. But as I said from the outset, um, we're going to read the Bible. This is not a, a, a course where you're going to get a certificate or you're going to get a diploma or you're going to get a tassel that you can take from one side of your cap and put it on the other side. But we're just going to read the Bible and let the Holy Spirit breathe life into the Word. So sometimes there's going to be uh, times in some of our sessions where we might get stuck on a word for the entire session. I don't want to use the, word, the term stuck on the Word, but we might just dwell on it because the Holy Spirit might deal with us that way, and we're going to get everything we can out of it. And then there's other times we're going to run right through a chapter. So let's let the Holy Spirit lead us. Um, so this is the second uh, session. Um, we're calling this one, and we're still in the first chapter. So we're going to subtitle this um, one, and we're going to call it The Fall of Man and the Rise of a Savior. The Fall of Man and the Rise of a Savior. Because as I said from the outset, the book of Romans is sort of the Christian, the church's constitution. If we get the book of Romans right, then we can really hold the keys to understanding the entire Bible. Conversely, if we get it wrong, um, we're kind of on our own. So we, we want to run through this book and we're going to, Paul is going to show in this book, at least in the first chapter, he's almost going to be like, and I want you to keep this in mind as we run through the first three chapters at least. He's almost going to be, I mean, picture yourself being in a courtroom and there's a prosecutor and, um, you know, and he's, he's making a case um, uh, to present his case and to, to reach a conclusion. The difference here is that in, in a courtroom, in a criminal case at least, the prosecutor is making a case with the objective to condemn a person or convict a person. Uh, but here, Paul is making a case with the objective to actually set a person free, to justify a person. But first he's got to show mankind that they need a savior. So before we get into the lesson, I just wanna give a praise report. Uh, many of you have been praying, um, some, of you, some of you have been giving to the ministry and praying for the ministry, and many of you are aware that we just returned from uh, two overseas crusades um, in March, we were in West Africa in the nation of Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. That's my, uh, my attempt at French, Cote d'Ivoire, but the Ivory Coast, West Africa, and Guinea um, in Crusades in Cote d'Ivoire and uh, a fire conference in uh, Guinea. And just two weeks ago, we were in South Asia um, for our second international um, uh, mission of the year. And uh, we're, just, we're just getting hard counts in from Asia. Um, they're still counting, but I think they're almost complete. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that uh, due to your prayers and your giving, and of course, the power of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, in two nights, we have 14,000, 14,000 new souls into the kingdom, confirmed uh, new converts with decision cards who made out decision cards and those decision cards were counted. You know, we don't, we don't guesstimate. And, and, you know, one of the things, one of the main things we never want to do is hold a crusade and there is no follow-up. You know, the follow-up is just as important as the crusade itself. Other than that, it's just like a big, you know, I call it like a Holy Ghost party and nobody knows what goes on or happens to the, uh, the people that got saved. So we make it a point to count and to follow up with those that have given their lives to Christ. So 14,000, I mean, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. I'm rejoicing in it, and I'm hoping that you're rejoicing with us. Um, you know, I always say that the angels in heaven rejoice because they've got something to do when a soul gets saved. You know, the Bible said that the angels are ministering spirits that are sent to minister to those that are heirs of salvation, you and me. So, you know, I mean, in my estimation from reading the Bible, the angels really only have two jobs. One is to praise God. If you look at Revelations, um, and there are three jobs. They're messengers of God. But the other is that they look after you and me at the behest of the Lord. So they're just going bonkers right now. So we had 14,000 confirmed um, uh, into the kingdom, decisions for Christ, 
hundreds of people miraculously getting healed, uh, just the power of God moving. And that doesn't count the people that got saved and delivered in the, the church fire conferences and, um, and youth conferences that we had while, while we were there in South Asia. We just got back. Um, and so the work of the Lord goes on. Next month, we'll be in uh, the Philippines in um, Samal City on Samal Island, which uh, for those of you that know anything about the Philippines, that's in the southern part of the nation um, in the region of Davao. It's just north of Malaysia. So we're looking forward to that. Um, if the, please pray for us. You know, we solicit your prayers. And if the Lord leads your heart, please listen to the Holy Spirit. Please, um, we'd appreciate your giving to the ministry. Um, you're watching us on the website now because other than being on the website and registered, you couldn't see us. And um, if the Lord lays it on your heart, just go to the donate button and make a donation to the ministry. For those of you that are in, your, are in the United States, it's tax deductible. Um, but for anybody that gives to the ministry in prayer, and uh, in any kind of financial donation so the work can go forward. You share in, in equal rewards of the harvest. That's important to know because not everybody can go. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is Jesus' last command. And so what does that mean? That means that's not optional. See, a lot of people look at that as if Jesus was making a suggestion. That wasn't a suggestion. That was a command. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he prefaced it by saying when he rose from the dead, all power is in my hands. So he's saying, I've got the power, you go. And heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. So in other words, he's saying, you received a gift for free, give a gift for free. And the gift is, is, is you going forth and, and ministering the gospel and supporting those that do. Not everybody can go, as I mentioned, but your prayers and your giving make this all possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you for those of you that are supporting this ministry. Um, it's an exciting time and God is doing great things in the earth today. So let's look at the book of Romans again. We're in the first chapter in the first verse, as I remind you, that well, I use the King James Version. I'm kind of an old school guy. You know, I've gotten over the these and the thous. I know, you know, most of the time that means you and y'all, <laughs> as we say in Chicago. Um, but, you know, feel free to follow along with whatever version you have. And I know, you know, many of you are in different nations, so you're not even using the English version of the Bible, of course. So, but the Word of God is the Word of God. And, and you'll be able to follow along. Um, at the end of each session, we pray for your needs. Um, Jesus is still moving. Jesus is still healing. We see God moving in, in our ministry in a great way on behalf of the people. We've got wonderful testimonies. You can see some of them um, on our, in our YouTube station, on our, on our social media pages, and here on our website of people with miraculous healings. I mean, at this last uh, crusade in South Asia, you know, blind recovered uh, their sight. You know, deaf ears were open. The lame walked. Uh, just the power of God. I mean, there were so many testimonies we had to cut them off in the interest of time. Um, but Jesus is doing the same thing all over the earth. He's no respecter of a person. So what he did in South Asia, he can do in America, he can do in Germany, he can do in Indonesia, he can do in Nigeria, he can do it in Russia. I mean, the Holy Spirit's in all the earth. The Bible says that in the last days, the Lord would pour his spirit out on all flesh. Now, that's a very profound statement. It's an all-encompassing statement. He said all flesh. He did not say church flesh. <laughs> he said all flesh. So the Holy Spirit is in the earth today. There's nowhere that we can go where the Holy Spirit is not. But it takes the gospel and prayer to ignite that power. And so uh, we're, we're praying for you at the end of this um, session. Um, please send your prayer requests to us. Um, in the contact tab there on the website and um, send us your testimonies. I mean, I got a couple of testimonies from last week. I didn't hear from a lot of people because, I, you know, everybody doesn't send in, but uh, of healings from the last session. And if you have questions, please send those in. 
We'll be doing a Facebook live, we'll be not Facebook, but we'll be doing live sessions here from time to time. But for now, I'm doing these as a video podcast because of the various time zones, as you can imagine. When someone sees this in Chicago, Illinois, in the USA, Central Time, where I am at 7 o'clock on Monday, then it's like 8 o'clock a.m. on Tuesday morning in the Philippines. It might be 5 a.m. in um, Lahore, Pakistan. It may be 2 a.m. in Lagos, Nigeria, and so on and so on. So that gives everyone an opportunity to view it um, when it's most convenient for them and also gives you an opportunity to go back and review um, if and when you feel the need to do so. So let's, uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, we're going to try to keep these to about 30 to 45 minutes per session. And let's jump right into the book of Romans, the first chapter. Again, we went over the first verse, but I'm going to read that again. And uh, we're going to read the first five chapters, try to go through that as quickly as we can. And then we're going to run up and then we're going to stop and do a, a more thorough reading of uh, excuse me, the first five verses. A more thorough reading beginning at verse 14 through the end of the first chapter, because I want to get through the first chapter today. First chapter, first verse of the book of Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And so we talked about that last week, Paul's description of himself. And, you know, we highlighted the fact that Paul had a keen awareness of who he was. And we also brought forth that every child of God should have a keen awareness of who he or she is in the body of Christ and where you're going. Because if you don't know who you are, you will never know who you're going. So Paul knew what he was. He was a servant. It's called. He was an apostle. And he was separated to the gospel of God. But then he pivots here. And he makes a brief introduction of himself, even though it's a very heavy and important introduction and powerful introduction of himself. But then he pivots here and gets to the subject of the book. And the subject of this book and the subject of the entire Bible is the gospel, the gospel of God. So he says, and then in the second verse, he says, which he had promised afore or before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So in the King James Version, that's a parenthetical statement. So Paul says in the first verse that I'm separated into the gospel of God. He starts talking about the gospel. And then he makes a parenthetical statement that the gospel has always been there. And a lot of people think the gospel starts in the New Testament, but it does not start in the New Testament. You know, the scripture says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it was always God's plan to save man. You know, when, when, when Adam fell, God didn't sit on the throne and look at Jesus and look at the Holy Spirit and say, you know, what are we going to do now? You know, pass me an aspirin. <laughs> he already had a plan. So the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And from the very beginning, all the prophets pointed and all the prophecies pointed toward a Messiah, a Savior. As a matter of fact, the very first prophecy that was uttered about the Messiah was uttered by none other than God himself. If you look at the book of Genesis, the third chapter and the 15th verse, it's what um, uh, Bible scholars will call the proto-evangel. Proto meaning first, evangel means good news. It was the first good news, it was the first proclamation of the Messiah. So Genesis 3 and 15, let's go to it very quickly. This is, the Lord God addressing the serpent who had beguiled Eve and who uh, tricked, well, he didn't fool Adam, as the Bible said. Adam just kind of walked into it. But the Lord addresses the serpent. Um, and he says in Genesis 3.15, I, God, will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed, the seed of the, the, the enemy, and her seed, which was Christ, and it, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, shall bruise your head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That was a prophecy from God about the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. And all the prophets since then prophesied or pointed to, not every word that they said pointed to Messiah, 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 but their core message, everything that they said was built around pointing forward to the Messiah. Let's look at some other scriptures to support that. If you look at the book of Hebrews, the first chapter and the first verse, it says in the King James Version, God, who at sundry times, 
in other words, many parts, and in diverse manners, in different ways, spake. He spoke. God was always speaking in times past unto the fathers or to our ancestors by the prophets. The prophets were used to speak to man. Man had fallen so far that they couldn't hear God, so they had to hear from another man or another woman. And God spoke to the prophets. But then in the second verse of Hebrews, um, the first chapter, it says, now God has in these last days, he sent prophet after prophet after prophet. But finally, in these last days, he sent his very best, he sent his son. So in essence, Jesus came to prophesy of himself. Hmm? And to proclaim himself because he is the way, the truth, and the life. See, when, when man talks about himself, then he's bragging, <laughs> basically. But when Jesus talks about himself, he's proclaiming because he is God's only solution. So the prophet's purpose was to prophesy of the gospel, as it says here in John uh, excuse me, in Romans 1 and 2. Let's look at another scripture to, to support that. Look, turn with me to the book of Acts, the 10th chapter and the 43rd verse. This is when Peter had gone to meet the Roman centurion Cornelius and was preaching to them. And uh, Acts 10, 43, Peter says, to him, Jesus, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him shall receive a remission of sin. So, the prophetic message has always been an evangelistic message. And an evangelistic message has always been a prophetic message. There's no difference. There's no separation. I know we've got the fivefold ministry. We have people that are prophets and people that are evangelists. But the point of it all is this. The point is evangelism to proclaim good news that there's a savior that was sent for the sins of mankind, whether it was pointing forward to Jesus coming before he came, whether now it's telling people that he has come or whether it's telling people that he's going to come. All prophecy concerns Jesus. The Bible says in Revelations 19.10 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So now we can take that a couple of ways. Some say that means the testimony about Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Or some say the testimony from Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But frankly, either way you take it, it's about Jesus. And no prophecy comes from man or woman. It's all generated by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, and all prophetic utterances come from the Holy Spirit. As Peter says in the first chapter of Peter, the 20th verse, first book of Peter, uh, 1 and 20, he says, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake in old times as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So what does the Holy Spirit talk about? If prophecy comes from the Holy Spirit, and it does, then what is, what is the subject of the Holy Spirit's prophetic utterances through us? Well, it's very plain in the Bible. Let's look at the book of the Gospel of John, the 16th chapter. Starting at the 13th verse, this is when Jesus was about to go um, to the cross and he was having his last time, uh, last times really speaking and telling his disciples what was going to come to pass and giving them instructions and giving them comfort. So he says in John 16 and 13, talking about the Holy Spirit, this is Jesus. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit does not speak of himself. So when you ever hear somebody talking about themselves, I mean, this is, this is really your, your barometer, your test. That's not the Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself, right? But whatever, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. 14th verse, Jesus says, he, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me. This is what the Holy Spirit does. If you look at the 15th chapter of John, the 26th verse, Jesus says, but when the comforter, the Holy Spirit has come, whom I will send, Jesus is the one who sins and he baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire unto you from the Father. Even the spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, 
he, the Holy Spirit, shall testify of me. So all, going back to the book of Romans, the second, first uh, chapter and second verse, Paul is emphatically saying and clearly saying, backed up by the scriptures we just went through, that the gospel was promised of old time by the prophets from the very beginning. Then in the third verse, he says the gospel is concerning or about his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So what Paul is saying here is that the gospel is not about the church. The gospel is not about our ministry. The gospel is not about our website. The gospel is not about our tribe. The gospel is about Jesus Christ, period. Jesus Christ is the good news. He is the gospel. And so I like how Reinhard Bonnke puts it. If we preach the gospel, the gospel will happen. If we preach Jesus, then Jesus will do what we preach him to do. If we preach him as a savior, he will save. If we preach him as a healer, he will heal. And I think one of the big problems that people are having nowadays in their ministry where they're not seeing the power of God. They're not seeing the signs and the wonders. I mean, we've got a lot of good preaching. We've got a lot of hand slapping and high-fiving and towels waving and people jumping off pulpits and rolling up in sheets. <laughs> we're doing a lot. We've just seen a lot of that. But we don't see a lot of power. And where there's an absence of power, there's an absence of preaching the gospel. Because the gospel itself is power. See, this is the thing. In the, in the book of Romans here, in the sixth, first chapter and 16th verse, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Paul did not say that the gospel is a tool for God to say. He didn't say that. He said the gospel is power. The gospel itself is power. And the gospel itself is telling about Jesus Christ and his work. Let's look at a couple of scriptures to underscore the fact that if we preach the gospel, power accompanies the gospel. The book of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter in the first verse, Paul is talking to the church of Corinth and he, and he recounts what happened when he went there to the church and he's writing them a letter you know, in his absence after he was there. And he said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech. I didn't come with great swelling words. I didn't come with jaw-breaking words. I didn't come to razzle you with my oratorical skills or my rhetoric. He said, or wisdom declaring unto you the, unto you the testimony of God. Second verse, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ, which is the gospel, and him crucified. This is what Paul preached. And he said in the third verse, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Fourth verse, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. And then he tells us why in the fifth verse. So your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Because the gospel is nothing if it's not a powerful gospel. I mean, what would separate the gospel and Christianity from any other, and I'd say other because Christianity is not a religion, but I'm saying that for discussion purposes. What separates Christianity from any religion in the world? There's a lot of religions in the world. They, 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 there's good speakers. There's charismatic people. Uh, there's a lot of intelligent people in the world. There's a lot of eloquent people in the world. There's a, there's a lot of smart people in the world. But only Christianity is backed by the power of God. Only the gospel is backed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the gospel is about Jesus. If we preach the gospel, we'll see what God can do. If we preach the original gospel, we'll get the original results. 
God is not different. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God said, I'm God, I change not. So let's get back to our, <laughs> to our session here. Third chapter, we said that the gospel, of Romans 1 and 3, concerning his, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and he was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. We know that, they, that Jesus came through the seed of David. He came through the Jewish race. He was promised um, um, to come through Abraham. God told Abraham that, you know, in thee and in thy seed with all nations of the earth we blessed. Um, it was promised to David. It was a Davidic covenant that uh, a, a king would um, be raised up on his throne and be the Messiah and reign forever. So we know that happened. And Mary, both Mary and Joseph, by the way, uh, were of the seed of David. They just came through different branches of the Davidic family. I believe uh, Mary came through the, um, the, the family of Nathan, which was one of David's sons. And I believe that um, Joseph came through the, uh, the branch of Solomon. And we know who Solomon was. He was, um, he was the king after David. But Jesus, there's no doubt that Jesus was born of the seed of David in fulfillment of prophecy. But then Paul says, but he was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. What was it that that was so striking and so emphatic that showed that Jesus was the son of God? It was his resurrection. It was the fact that he rose from the dead. He laid down his life. See, a lot of people say, well, I can take my own life. Well, you really can't. <laughs> There's a lot of people that have tried to commit suicide and it didn't work. You know, God forbid, I hope nobody else, nobody does that, but we know it happens every day. But you really can't take your own life. You know, you can't bring yourself into the world. We know that. But you really can't take your own life. Jesus had the power to lay down his life and take it up again. So he was declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. The enemy thought he had him when Jesus died. You know, I could believe, I, I'll bet they, well, not bet, but I mean, I, if I were betting, man, I would wager that, you know, the devil and his demons were like, ah, we got him now, we killed him, you know. And uh, they were probably having a field day. But Jesus rose, his, rose and said, listen, I am he that was dead, and now I'm alive, and I've got the keys of hell and death. So he had the keys, he's got the keys. And so what does that mean for you and I? Well, first of all, if Jesus Christ didn't rise, then, you know, our faith is in vain. So, you know, his resurrection is for our justification. But the other thing that's very important is that that same resurrection power is in every believer. This is something that we've got to be conscious of every day. You know, I hear people say that, you know, I'm going to pray until the Lord, the power of the Lord comes down. And, you know, I like these songs. You know, I've been around for a, a few years. And, you know, I used to hear them and sing and shout. And, you know, and God bless them. People are well-meaning with some of these songs. But scripturally, a lot of these songs are wrong. You know, you don't have to pray till the Holy Spirit comes down. You don't have to pray the Holy Spirit down. You don't have to fast him down. You don't have to run around the block three times. I mean, the Bible says, and Jesus himself said, that the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. He doesn't leave and then come back. You know, he doesn't have to find his way back. We don't have to put a, a GPS or a homing device out to try to find the Holy Spirit. He's with you forever. And Jesus himself said, listen, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So we must know that that same resurrection power is in us. Not only will it bring life to every dead area of our life, if your ministry is dead, if your marriage is dead, if, 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 you know, if, you're just, if your body is sick, all of that is in your life. Not only that, you export power. Right? Power in the Bible is always designated. You know, power is always being given. Power emits from the man and the woman of God, from the Christian. So we've got to be keenly aware of that. Let's, let's move on, because I do want to get through with this chapter. And if I have to turn my little timer off, I'll do that. I think I do want to get through the chapter. So let's continue reading. Fifth verse, by whom we all, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ. 
And then he tells who he's actually writing this book to, but by extension, he's writing this to the church at large. Seventh verse, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I mean, the Romans were, they were at, they were in the seat of power. I mean, the Roman Empire was the capital of the known and civilized world at that time. And it was a pagan, idolatrous empire, but there were Christians there. Paul did not start the Church of Rome. The Church of Rome was there, the Church at Rome was there before Paul got there, which tells you that the gospel was being spread even at the time. And he said, you all have a good reputation. Your faith is spoken of throughout the world. Ninth verse, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. He hadn't been there yet. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. He wanted to give them an impartation. That is, I'm that I may be comforted together with the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, brethren, I would have, I would not, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you again, underscoring the fact that he hadn't been to Rome yet, but there were Christians there. There was a strong body of believers there, but I was let or prevented up until now, hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. 14th verse, and let's start getting into it. Paul says, and he describes himself here as a debtor. He said, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, to the wise and to the unwise. Paul calls himself a debtor. So what is a debtor? First of all, a debtor is someone that has an obligation. He's someone or she is someone that owes something to another party, to another entity, to another person. So a debtor means two things. Number one, that a person owes. Number two, it means there's a creditor, right? You can't, there can't be a debtor without a creditor, the person to whom the obligation belongs. So Paul describes himself as a debtor, right? So who are his creditors? Well, he tells who his creditors are. He said, I'm a debtor to everybody. I'm a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarians. I'm a debtor to the Jews and, 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 and to the Gentiles. I'm a debtor to the wise and the unwise. I owe the gospel. Why? Because Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. As I said from the outset, the gospel, preaching of the gospel and spreading of the gospel and witnessing is not optional. So when Jesus says, again, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out devils. That means we should actively be doing that because that is a command. It's not an option. That's a command that God gave. So we should be looking for sick people to heal. <laughs> you know, we should be looking for dead people to raise. We should be looking for demons to cast out. We should, you know, everybody is not on, you know, on the world, world circuit right now. But don't limit yourself. The world should be your goal. You're not a local citizen. You are a global citizen because you're part, if you're a child of God, you're part of the Abrahamic global family. And God said to Abraham, in thee and in thy seed, and we're the seed of Abraham, if you're a child of God, a child of faith, in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. So you have to think global. You have to think that you're a global citizen, and that is your obligation. Um, God said something to me so emphatic. See, if we, if we limit ourselves, then we're shortchanging God. And God said to me something to me last week so emphatically in the wee hours of the morning during my devotion. He said, if you do not limit me, I will not limit you. That's all he said. But it just hit me just so starkly. I mean, it was so strong. If you do not limit me, I do not limit, I will not limit you. That makes what you can do limitless. So you're a global citizen. Uh, let's go on. 15th verse, Paul says, I am not as, as much as is in me. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you there at Rome also. 
Paul said, I am not ashamed, 16th verse, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That doesn't mean to the Jew first because the Jews have the preeminence. This is a chronological statement. The gospel came to the Jews first. Jesus was sent to the lost halls of Israel, but he was not sent exclusively to the Jews. And it was not that the Jews have any more rights to the gospel than people that live in Mozambique. That means it just happened to come to them first. But Paul said the gospel is the power of God. It's God's, the gospel itself is a divine tool. The gospel itself is divine energy to do what it's designed to do. And that is to free men and women from the power of sin. 17th verse where he says, for therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. As I said last week when I started off, this word, this is a, a, a very small word, it's a very subtle word, but it's an article, the, for therein in the gospel is the righteousness. Paul did not use that in the original text. It was translated in, it, translated in, translated into some versions, the word the, because he either said, the gospel is righteousness of God or a righteousness of God, but not the righteousness of God. And it's in the same vein as saying, you know, the cat or a cat. When you say the cat, you're talking about a particular cat and an exclusive cat, the only cat. When you'd say a cat, it could be any number of cats. So what Paul is saying here, and this reveals or this shows us Paul's keen understanding, revelation of the gospel he says that the gospel is a righteousness of God. What does that mean? It means that God is righteous. He's not made righteous by the gospel. He was righteous before the gospel. This is nature. The holy angels are righteous, but they're not made righteous by the gospel either. The gospel doesn't pertain to them. As a matter of fact, if, if they could be made righteous by the gospel, the devil would probably repent. Because he could see what's coming, the devil and his demons. You know, they would throw themselves at the mercy of the heavenly court. But he can't because he has no path, because the gospel does not pertain to them. The Bible says that in 1 Peter 1.12, that the gospel is something that the angels desire to look into. They don't understand it. It doesn't even pertain to them. So, but what am I saying then? And what was Paul saying? He's saying that the gospel doesn't pertain to God. It doesn't make him righteous. He's righteous by nature. The gospel doesn't pertain to the angels because it has nothing to do with him. But it's a special path. It's a special particular way of righteousness, a particular brand of righteousness, if you will, that only pertains to you and me. It only pertains to humans. It only pertains to mankind. See, when the devil fell, he just fell. He was on his own. But when Adam fell, God sent a savior. So the gospel is God's power to save. So now we begin to get into the fall of man. And from the 18th verse to the end of the chapter, Paul is going to give a description of the gradual descent of man the further he gets away from God. To make this transition, Paul gives two contrasting revelations. First, in the 17th verse, the righteousness of God is revealed. But then in the 18th verse, Paul says the wrath of God is revealed. And so let's just read it. 18th verse says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is revealed or manifest in them, for God has showed it to him. So what Paul is saying is that the wrath of God is against mankind because of sin. God doesn't hate mankind. God hates sin. He's against sin. So what is the greatest sin? A lot of people say, well, you know, adultery or murder is worse than a little white lie or, you know, stealing your first communion money when you were eight years old or, and all that sort of thing. Well, it's all unrighteousness is sin. So, you know, it's big sins, small sins, all of those, you know, will prevent us from uh, eternal life. But the greatest sin 
that man has ever committed and which they still commit is the sin of unbelief. See, the scripture here says that the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So this says that they know. And he says, Paul says it clearly in the 19th verse, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. So what Paul is saying is the greatest sin is knowing the truth and knowing light and rejecting it. See, let's, let's go to the Gospel of John quickly. Gospel of John, first chapter in the first verse, or excuse me, in the first chapter rather. First chapter in the fourth verse, talking about Jesus or the word, it says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Fifth verse, and the light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended or suppressed it not. The light, the, the darkness tried to suppress it, but it could not do it. Let's go to the, to the, to the uh, third chapter of John. Third chapter in the 17th verse, we know the 16th uh, verse is the most famous verse in the Bible probably. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 17th verse, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that, he, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes in him is not condemned, but he that believes not or lives in unbelief is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So unbelief is the greatest sin. Let's continue reading in the 19th verse. And this is the condemnation. Jesus explains exactly what the condemnation is. That light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They made a choice. Mankind made a choice. They, light came into the world. There was darkness and there was light. Man chose darkness. As we read in the, in, in the first chapter of John and the fifth verse, that the light lights every man that comes into the world and the darkness just tried to suppress it, but it could not. But man has made a choice. Back here in the third chapter in the 20th verse, it says, for everyone that does evil hates light. Neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light that his deeds might be made manifest that they are wrought or have their origin in God. So back to the first chapter of Romans and here in 18th and the 19th verse, Paul describes how man fell from God and continued falling. Let's look at the 20th verse. It says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That seems to be a contradiction. How can invisible, invisible things be clearly seen? But, and Paul explains it, how that can be. It said, because those invisible things, God himself, angels, spirits, the world to come, those, those invisible things are clearly seen, being, the, being understood by the things that are made. The Bible even says in the book of Psalms, in the 19th uh, chapter, in the first verse, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth declares its, 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 its handiwork. Day unto day under, uh, utter its speech. Night un, unto night utter its, utters knowledge. There's no place in the world, no speech or language anywhere in the world that their speech is not heard. I don't care what language you speak. The, the sun, the moon, the, the creation itself shouts that there's a God. But man has rejected that. 21st verse. And now this is a gradual descent in three stages. How man went further and further away from God. 21st verse through the 24th verse of Romans, first chapter. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. They knew God. It wasn't as if they didn't know. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations or their reasoning or their logic. They tried to uh, reason God out of creation. They tried to reason God out of, out of their minds and their foolish heart was darkened. That was the consequence. Once they rejected the knowledge of God, darkness came in. And it obscured their ability to understand God. But then they professed themselves to be wise. They became fools and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man 
and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is the consequence in verse 24. Because man, when they knew God, they weren't thankful. They didn't glorify God. They professed themselves to be wise and be they became fools. And they changed the image of God into corruptible things like birds and beasts. And even today, people are saying, well, we don't worship statues anymore. We're not idolatrous. Well, we've reduced and put the images of men and women on currency. And people worship them. Believe me, people worship money. You know, we've got, you know, in America, we've got the Benjamins and we've got, you know, Abraham Lincoln on dollars and George Washington. People are worshiping those images, right? But they're just reduced to paper. But they changed the image of God into those corruptible things. So what happened in verse 24? It says, therefore, also God gave them up. They gave God up, then God gave them up to what? He didn't curse man. He gave God, God gave man up to what was already inside of man. To the uncleanliness, up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own bodies, to dishonor of their own hearts, to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Immorality you know, uh, desecration of the human race through dishonoring uh, each other through immorality. This is what was in man. As long as they, let me turn off my timer. As long as man was in touch with God, as long as man was in touch with the power source, then man lived, lived a victorious life. Once man separated from God, from the laws of God, from the will of God, from the knowledge of God, which is what happened with Adam's sin. And we saw how Cain, his, his, his son, killed his brother, and it, it, it gradually got worse and worse and worse until um, God had to take everybody away during the time of Noah and the flood, but it's gotten worse again. But it was when man walked away from God by sinning. 25th verse, and then we started a, new, uh, a, a, a further descent. It said, who, man, changed the truth of God into a lie, called God a liar, basically. God's truth into a lie and worshiped and served the creation, the creature, more than the creator, the sun, the moon, the stars, astrology. Instead of the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. What happened after that? This is the next drop down. For this God, God also gave them the vile affections. First, it was just garden variety there's no such thing as garden variety and morality but it, it it was between men and women dishonoring themselves in the 24th verse 26th verse it got worse for this god god they, god gave them up to vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature and likewise also the men homosexuality leaving the natural use of the woman, burn their lust, lust toward one another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense or the reward or the consequence, probably a better word, of their error which was appropriate. You know, there's people that say, well, you know, he or she was born a homosexual. That's not true. You know, that's, God does not make you a sinner. <laughs> God does not make people sin. He does not make people predisposed to sin. If God says that homosexuality is a sin and an abomination, he's not going to make you that way. And so that's not something that somebody is born with. That's a spirit. And it's a spirit that's the result of man walking away, mankind walking away from God. This is the final step down, starting in verse 28 to verse 32. So first... In verse 24, immorality came in. Verse 26, 27, a deeper form of immorality, which was homosexuality, unnatural affection. Verse 28, it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Not convenient sounds a little, a little mild. These are some dastardly things. We're going to read off the litany of, of characteristics of fallen man in the next couple of verses in a minute. But I want to dwell for a second on this, this word reprobate. Because when I was growing up, you know, when people said you had a reprobate mind, they basically were saying, well, you know, you're lost. You're doomed. You know, it's lights out, curtains down. It's, it's all over for you. God gave you over to a reprobate mind. You're gone. And we were like, wow, hope I never get to that point. <laughs> But, you know, that's not what it means here, because first of all, as long as you're alive, if you're in sin and if you, you've gotten away from God, you can always get back. God always gives space to repent. You know, and I think the big 
lesson, uh, one of the major lessons we can learn from Peter and Judas is just that. You know, both of them, Peter and Judas, both turn their backs on the Lord during um, his hour. Judas did not think there was any path to redemption. Judas did not have the faith to know that the Lord could forgive anything that he did, even betrayal. I mean, you know, let's go back in the Old Testament. Let's look at, look at Saul and David. You know, David, Saul committed some sins. You know, most of his sins were disobedience and arrogance. I think the worst sin that Saul committed was when, um, you know, God told him and, and Samuel told him to destroy the Amalekites and he destroyed everybody but, you know, the best of the Amalekites and Agag, the king. Um, that was probably, and then, you know, later on, he got worse and worse and he tried to kill David and he didn't do it. He wasn't uh, successful. But David, I mean, man, we can run through a litany of stuff David did. But I mean, you know, the worst is the famous situation with, you know, Uriah uh, the Hittite and his wife Bathsheba. You know, now a lot of people don't focus on the fact that David had 30 mighty men. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. Uriah the Hittite was not just an ordinary soldier. He was one of David's bodyguards. David stole a man's wife, impregnated her, sent Uriah to the front lines to have him killed, and then took the woman in the house. You know, as if, well, you know, her husband's dead. You know, I'm loose from, you know, she's loose from her marriage. And David had him killed, you know. But Saul never found repentance because he never sought it like that. David repented immediately. And so getting back to this reprobate mind, they get me going. I went through the litany and uh, of the characteristics of people that you know uh, have just walked away from God, the final level of descent. But no matter what your condition is, no matter what you've done, it can never separate you from the love of God. God always loves you, and He's always standing ready to forgive. He said, "Come now and let us reason together," saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. Uh, you know, I, was, I shall make him white as snow. He can wash away any sin. Um, so it's never too late. So let's just read it, this and then we're going to wrap it up and we're going to pray and prepare for the next session. 29th verse. It says, these at the last level of descent, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, Whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. And that's a, that's a pretty bad list. And you'd say, wow, well, what could get worse than that? I mean, you know, it's kind of Paul kind of covered it all. But it's not that's not it. The 30 second verse is what's so striking to me. Because after Paul went through that, 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 that list of, 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 of terrible characteristics of people that have just completely walked away from God, 32nd verse of the first chapter of Romans, Paul says, who knowing the judgment of God, first of all, they know the consequences, that they which commit such things are worthy of death because the wages of sin is death. So they know it and they know they're worthy of death. But Paul says, not only do they do it, but they have pleasure in others that do them. This is the condition of fallen man. So, as I said, you know, I, what, I've, what I've named this, this session is the fall of man and the rise of the Savior. So, if you, again, put yourself in that courtroom, here's, here's Paul the prosecutor, you know, saying, listen, this is the condition of man. This is what they've done. This is, this is where they are. But, you know, and it, it's almost like what, what, what the Lord did in the beginning of, I, in the book of Isaiah, in the first chapter, I believe it starts at the first verse. He's almost like in a courtroom and, and heaven and earth are his, his, his jury. And it's like the Lord is saying to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, heaven and earth, hear, O heaven and hear, O earth. I have raised and nourished up children and they have rebelled against me. You know, he's making a case. But the difference between a prosecutor making a case to an accused, against an accused criminal to condemn the person and throw them in prison, Paul is making a case for a savior. He's making a case that, look, look, 
Look at what you've done. Look at where you are. Look at how far you're away from God. Look, these things that you're doing are worthy of death, but God has given a solution. He's, he's provided a savior. So this, this, this argument of Paul's is so profound. And as we get into the second verse, we're going to, in the second verse, in the second chapter, rather than the third chapter, we're going to talk about what about the Jew, what about people that have never heard the gospel. And, you know, the fourth chapter, we're going to get into the, uh, toward the end of the third chapter, we'll get into righteousness uh, by faith, which is uh, the message of the gospel and the gist of the gospel. And we'll go on. So, um, again, be back with us next Monday. This is going, this lesson, uh, this session and uh, last week's session will be on the website there. Um, they're available to you to access at any time um, after the initial airing. Um, please feel free to contact us you know, with any questions you have with your prayer request. And uh, we'll get back with you at some point in the future, not the distant future, we're going to do live sessions. So, um, you know, we can, we'll do some Facebook lives. We'll do some lives here on the, uh, through YouTube on the website, through my YouTube channel. And we'll have some questions and interaction. But initially, I wanted to do it this way because of the different time zones, as I'm sure you all understand. So now we want to pray. Uh, we're going to pray for your needs. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As I said from the outset, you know, we see miraculous testimonies of, 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 of he testimonies of miraculous healings and the power of God in our ministry um, all over the world. And wherever you are, Jesus is there. So there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Sometimes you just have to ask. And every time you just got to believe. So bow your head now and close your eyes. Whatever your condition is, Jesus is able to meet that need, whether it's a physical condition, whether it's a condition in your home with your children, whether it's a condition or there's something your marriage needs to be, your marriage needs to be uh, uh, mended and repaired. Jesus is able to do it. So Let's pray now. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, for your love. We thank you, Lord, and we take authority over every condition in everybody that's here. We thank you, Lord. We take authority over cancer. We take authority over HIV AIDS. We speak to arthritis. We speak to every condition that's here. We believe you now, Lord, and we're trusting you. And we thank you and we bless you and we magnify you in Jesus' name. We decree it and it is so. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll see you next week.